Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. This is the show where we talk about how everything in Montpelier shakes out for the rest of us. I am your host, Olga Peters, and I want to welcome to the show regular contributor, Representative Emily Kornheiser from Brattleboro. Hi, Emily. Hello, Olga. And I also want to uh, welcome Rep. Tiffany Bloomley. We just practiced that and then my brain went completely (laughs) empty. Um, Thank you for joining us, uh, Tiff. She is a representative from the Chittenden 65 district. And some may also know Tiff as the founder of Change Your Story, Change Change the Story. So glad you can be here today, Tiff. And today we're going to talk about legislation around establishing a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which, as far as I understand, Emily, has passed the House and is now in one of the committees with the Senate. Is that as is that correct? Mm -hmm. It was one of the many, many, many amazing bills that we got out in time for crossover this year and got sent over to the Senate. Yeah. And Tiff, tell us a little bit about this legislation. Well, um, you know, it's, it is a piece of legislation that grows out of the eugenics apology that we passed last year, which uh, apologized for the General Assembly's role in eugenics policies and practices. And it, there was, uh, we resolved at the end of um, uh, that resolution, a uh, commitment to doing, using legislative action to address the harm that had been caused. Um, And not just that particular, you know, the harm that was caused by eugenics, but the ripple effect of eugenics and what the eugenics movement actually meant, where, how, what it was grounded in, which was um, a, a belief system um, in a kind of a hierarchy of uh, being. And so at any rate, that's, they, this was our committee's first um, commitment um, as a result of the apology. Mm-hmm. And I, you, Tiff. I believe when we passed the apology, we did a show on that. Um, yes, we, we did. Off? We did. Okay. So if listeners want to go back to the Wayback Machine um, on our website, they can find the show on the eugenics apology. Um, and that was an incredibly moving and powerful moment. And one of the things that I really, one of the reasons I wanted you specifically on here, Tiff, to talk about this, I know, you know, you serve on the committee of jurisdiction that did the work um, on both the apology and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. But really, I think pretty early in your service as a legislator, I remember you convening this conversation and really sort of thinking really deeply and struggling through in the best possible way with really fundamental questions of process with regards to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and even what an apology meant. Um, And so I would love to even sort of start with that piece of like, what does it even mean to form a commission like that? And um, who are we to be doing that? And sort of all of those, all those big questions. Is that too big to jump right in with, Olga? No, no. I mean, I think it's, I I think it's in some ways the most interesting Um, aspect of the of the discussion about it because anybody can read the bill and understand exactly what you know its pieces are and how we imagine it working etc but what I what I have found really an interesting exercise is to figure out what is the legislature's role and what is it not and I've always known in my past work good work is generally iterative and it takes into account what is happening around um, one and and it and it needs to be informed by multiple perspectives so where you think you may be going may not at all be where you need to go and 
so the challenge in developing a commission was to try to figure out, well, how do you, how do you create a structure or provide a container that's strong enough and well-supported enough uh, to do this work and not dictate uh, uh, too much about how they're going to do that work. And, and, I, and I have found that legislators, we, we tend to like to spell that all out. And we, you know, and, and, um, <clears throat> yeah. and so that, and it was, I think, a frustrating process for some, you know, to see, to, you know, to not know and, um, and, and to, to not know exactly, well, what populations would be f- focusing on. The, the legislation identifies um, indigenous Vermonters, people of color, and um, individuals and families living with disabilities. And, and but um, the commission could decide that it wanted to take testimony from other groups that have been harmed by discriminator, just huh, discriminatory uh, processes or policies of the state. And it's a big job. The commissioners on this commission uh, have, a, have a significant responsibility to, um, to chart a course that is informed by the voices that matter. And the voices that matter are not legislators. The voices that matter are the people in our communities who have been harmed who have something to say. And hopefully what they have to say will help us better understand our history, not just eugenics, but our history, our impact as a legislature on different populations. Um, and that will, I mean, it, it, that alone won't lead to erasing the harm or repairing it. Um, But it's a step, it's a critical step in the process. And through that process, I anticipate that those participating in it will develop a better sense of, well, what would repairing the harm mean to them? And it's gonna be different. Um, And it's not, it's not gonna be, the same within any particular population either, because if you talk to different indigenous Vermonters who've been active in providing testimony, they would define the, that differently. And that, and that's so, <clears throat> and, and I, I think that what that means is then um, the steps, the next steps that are recommended through this commission will reflect what we're told <laughs> and not what we've brainstormed around a table um, and think makes lots of sense, um, and, you know, and that's the way that a lot of groups or institutions do things, not just the legislature, but um, so it is a first step. But I, and I, you know, I convene that group, um, Emily, because, you know, uh, our committee <clears throat> was just a group of 11 people and 11 people with a certain set of experiences. But I wanted to hear from my peers, a broader constellation of peers who were active in, in thinking about issues of equity um, and social justice to help me think through what are the pitfalls you know, in a process like this. And about the pitfalls of even, and to make it sort of what the, I think for me, the biggest pitfall that you started with, um, which is the legislature needs to initiate this in both as the harming party and in order to make this real because we hold power. And so when we act, we often make things real. Um, that's like what reify, basically like the definition of reify is like, Mm -hmm. you know, all wrapped up in legislative power. And so what does it mean for us, um, an incredibly privileged group of folks holding power to initiate a process that's about repair and harm? And how do we do that in a way that's even like marginally inclusive, let alone fully inclusive of what people actually want 
given that we have a process that really at every turn hinders meaningful participation. We have a lot of mechanisms for participation, but meaningful participation is so very different than testimony in a lot of cases. Oh, that is so correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, yeah, I, I, and that was the, that was part of the challenge too, right? Because we took a lot of testimony and listened hard to a range of people, including the International um, Center for Transitional Justice, which has worked, you know, with 40 different reconciliate truth and reconciliation processes across the world. And uh, so we took this in, but ultimately we were the ones that decided, right? And uh and I think, and so I hope that we have built in a, a, enough room for the voices that need to come to the fore to really have an impact on the direction that the commission takes and the um, uh, and the work and the work that it does and and how deep, how broad, um, you know, they they go. Mm-hmm. There were, as we've noted, there are a lot of different pitfalls, <clears throat> the one you just articulated, but obviously inclusion is a, you know, a, a, another one, right? How do you include <clears throat> enough of the voices? Because it will never, we will, you know, whether the, the commission will probably hold public hearings, it will probably organize small group discussions, it may even do one-on-one interviews with certain um, individuals um, <clears throat> and that, but it won't, it, it won't reach everybody. And so, um, so, so we're going to need the buy-in and the participation of folks in those affected communities uh, to help do the outreach and, um, and, identify um, the groups that, and the leaders with whom we ought to be talking. So um, I think, so I think that's one pitfall, right? That we can't yeah. reach everyone. Um, mm-hmm. And that the idea that even when we use the word communities, it's really a stand in for something that's not, a com- is not a community, right? No. So that pitfall. And then there's the other pitfall, <laughs> um, which includes sort of, sorry, that first pitfall sort of includes this, um, we were, I was working on a totally unrelated piece of legislation yesterday and someone else on the committee sort of noticed that we had made a list and said like, one of the first things I learned when I got here was like, whenever you put a list in legislation, you're probably leaving something out and you shouldn't Mm -hmm. even try. And I was like, oh my God, I like remember the moment in committee my first year where I learned that problem of the list, right? Mm -hmm. And then, so there's that, there's like, we can't be inclusive enough. And then there's sort of the other side of the pitfall, which is one of, you know, is something I really struggled with, with thinking about the commission was about being too wide to be able to go deep, right? Like, mm-hmm. is this, what does it mean to just focus on eugen- eugenics? How, like, that seems to be incredibly broad, impacted folks, but like, are we just talking about descendants of people who experience eugenics in Vermont? Are we only talking about indigenous Vermonters? There's a lot of people who experience eugenics in Vermont. Most people, when they think of truth and reconciliation, think of, you know, mostly black people. And so like, how does this all, like, how do you go deep with such totally, people with really like very different lived experiences and very different identities? Mm-hmm. It's a great question, and and one with which we wrestled um, a great deal. I where we ended up was in um, enabling the commission to form committees that would be composed of people who um, uh, represent different communities or populations, and that they and and you know there's an intersectionality across those. Um, those groups, but but their but their lived experiences um, and the impact of policies like eugenics uh, could be very very different, and their willingness to talk 
about Mm -hmm. those experiences may be very, very different. And what they need from the state could be very different as well. Uh, And so that is why, I mean, it, it, it is not a kind of a mishmash monolithic approach and that will be a challenge for um, the commissioners. And Mm -hmm. it is why we have funded it to the degree that we have. I mean, uh, about three quarters of a million dollars in this first appropriation. And we expect over four years to um, spend close to $5 million on it. Why? Because we believe that the commissioners need to be full-time staff you know, I mean, not not staff, but they need to be paid for their service because they you want continuity. Um, you know, you don't want them to leave because they couldn't afford to do what they were doing. Um, and you also want to respect the work. Um, secondly, we have there needs to be a director, a staff person who can handle all of the administrative responsibilities. Uh, and do some of the outreach that's going to be important. And you may, there may be research that is um, needed to fill in gaps um, because um, we don't know all that we need to know uh, about um, property access, um, you know, in the life of the state of Vermont and who's had access and who hasn't. I mean, there are, there are gaps. Anyway, so so, you know, I think that having spending that kind of spending state resources on this signals, this is important, it's a priority, and, and to underfund it would have been a huge um, mistake. I, 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 and, and I'm really proud of the House for having committed itself to supporting it in this way. Um, And it's just a first step, you know. Uh, There's a lot more social equity legislation that will hopefully follow and not wait until the three years that the, you know, commission has to do its work because things will bubble up and become obvious as a result of the work that they're doing, you know, along the way, which will prompt legislation. Um, so before sorry. we talk about what comes yes. next, um, sure. I don't, yeah. Olga, it sounded like you had a question and I have one too. Thanks, Emily. Yeah, um, I have a, a couple of questions. I don't know which one should come first, but a couple of things that are coming to the surface for me is one just kind of a practical question is, Given how deep this work needs to be, does the commission have a lot of flexibility in how it wants to structure itself and its process going forward? And then the second one is, um, you know, this is, um, especially just taking eugenics as an example, for a lot of people, this is decades ago. And, And so I'm wondering what, fell into place now or what made it possible now for this commission to this legislation to to happen well without a eugenics apology without the history that was presented on the floor um and the 10 years that it took (laughs) to get that passed um because there are Lots of legislators who have heard about this apology for a long time. And, and who have sponsored it. Yeah, it's amazing, how many, it's amazing how many different people have sponsored the eugenics right. apology over the decade until it passed. That, I think that's very, yeah. I mean, and, sad, but, but yeah. yeah. You know, Vermont, it, I think, recognizes and has a lot of work to do. I think we have some extraordinary social equity leaders um, in Susanna Davis and um, Kaya Morris and and others who have um, led the way in laying bare uh, 
social equity uh, deficits. And, you know, you think about the experience with COVID, right? The racial disparities that were, um, uh, that, that existed during COVID in terms of access to vaccinations, information, language, you know, translation of, of health directives, et cetera. I, I think that there is a new awareness about about the need to think about these things more and that we are way more diverse than we think we are. Um, and, and, you know, obviously the kind of the rec the racial reckoning that the nation has experienced over the last two years has, has been, I think, really helpful in making the case for something like this. Um, um one thing that I really noticed sort of towards the racial reckoning this country has gone through, and I think part of why maybe the eugenics bill was possible to pass this last year, is um, when I've, when we sort of started doing way more um, sort of internal conversations about racism with the caucus um, and like doing our own internal work as a caucus mm -hmm. and less about sort of what we were doing politically outside. Um, it was really interesting to hear how many people said like my kids or my grandkids are the ones who have sort of, um, you know, told me I need to like get it together basically. I mean, there's like lots of different ways of, you know, framing that and phrasing that, but it was really the intergenerational nature of this reckoning has, was very interesting for me to learn about and to participate in. I really appreciated that, especially given, you know, like, Tiff from Burlington, especially, but even just being from Brattleboro, like we both represent much more diverse places than the majority of the state. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's, you know, to see sort of how people come to the need for this work has been really interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, and also I think that people, uh, you know, you think about what happened at Clemens Farm and you think about the, the you know, I, I think we're constantly surprised by things that we read in the news. <laughs> like, oh my God, really? Really? And you have to take seriously that we have a problem. And it's not, it's a problem that is nationwide. Vermont is not different, but we are whiter. And it is easier for us to kind of, uh, to imagine that we don't have the same kind of racial tension um, or inequities because um, we're not, we don't, we don't have to see, we're, see them all the time. Anyway, it, I, I guess this has been a long time coming. So <laughs> I, I, you know, in some ways I was shocked that this was an 11 year old apology and that it, it took that long because eugenics doesn't seem to me to be a controversial topic in that. Apologize, you know, being against eugenics doesn't. Yeah, seem what, yes, that, that, that it's pretty easy to know where you stand on or where one should stand on that issue. Um, and I don't really understand what made it so difficult um, mm -hmm. uh, to, to get that apology through. Um, but I, I, I think part of it is that was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. That I mean, it's what you said earlier, you know, a long, long time ago, it's not, I didn't do this. <clears throat> um, and also maybe apologizing on be, you know, having the general assembly apol apologize for something that's kind of big, mm -hmm. right? I mean, we're taking own, we're taking responsibility for ways in which we are culpable. One thing that I was, I continue to be struck by on this issue um, is the sort of party politics of it in that, and I think I've said this on another time we were talking about indigenous um, and Abenaki issues, Olga, but that because of sort of the nature of rurality in Vermont and, um, politics and all these things, we have more Republican members that identify as having Indian blood, that's their language, not mine, than we hmm. do Democrat members. And so 
I think that creates this like really awesome opening for people to be able to mm. participate in something that in a lot of other areas of the country can be um, where racial conversations can be quite partisan. This mm -hmm. sort of didn't start as a racial conversation. It started as a conversation about Vermont's history and Vermont's history with its indigenous population. Um, and so that's a piece of it that I sort of always try to come back to about sort of what it means for other kinds of change in Vermont um, and how we bring lots of people into a conversation that might from the outside look be like a national flashpoint issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that <clears throat> I think that the experience <clears throat> of and the harm done to those um, with disabilities and family families with members who are disabled, mm -hmm. I think that's I don't think we know nearly enough about those stories mm -hmm. and about, and, and the stigma that continues to, um, limit access, um, to all sorts of things, uh, for people living with disabilities. And I, I am, I am very hopeful that that history will be, um, you know, a, a much bigger part of our conversation, because I think actually we have a lot, there's a lot of legislative action that we need to take to address the needs of people who live with disabilities and, <clears throat> you know, the rate at which they are employed, what they earn um, is startling. And we found that with the change of story reports that we were doing. And um, it it's never really reported. Um, you know, and uh, it, it, so at any rate, I, and I think, you know, the, in terms of even the very sort of base functionality of the eugenics um, system in Vermont, there's still tremendous pressure around sterilization and um, certain kinds of, you know, about people's ability to raise their children or to maintain mm -hmm. their pregnancies um, mm -hmm. if folks have significant mental health or um, mm -hmm. emotional or physical disabilities. I mean, that's like, yeah. that's still baked into our Department of Children and Families procedures and policies. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And that was one of the part, powerful things about the eugenics conversation is sort of people who had witnessed that firsthand. And were, yeah speaking to it. And, you know, who <clears throat> remember being at the Brandon facility, yeah. you know, yeah. um, and, mm -hmm. or who, you know, who, <clears throat> uh, at any rate, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, uh, it's haunting. It's really haunting that part of the history. Yeah. It's also haunting that, you know, it's really hard to get many indigenous folks to talk mm -hmm. about, mm -hmm the ripple effect that eugenics had in driving people underground and depriving them of opportunities to really celebrate their culture mm -hmm. and their language and um, identify themselves. And that's, you know, it, at any rate, it's going to be hard. <laughs> it's I think before we go to a break, I would just like to say, I feel like although we've done enough shows about this topic and um, we've been working together for long enough that I'm going to say that usually Olga waits until the very end of one of these shows before she um, says aloud that her family and like that she has this history in her own family. And so in the interest of sort of um, hmm. helping move us towards more honest conversations about it, I'm going to out you, Olga, and hope you forgive me because we've been doing this together long enough and you certainly usually say it, you just wait until the very end of the show, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, um, I, I want to be very clear. I don't have, um, my family's been impacted by eugenics, not to the level that many families were. I want to be very clear about that. I, I feel some families have much more horrific experiences than than mine and I also um as a child in elementary school ran into some 
um, language that it wasn't until I was an adult, I realized was kind of the language of eugenics. Um, but what stands out for me with these experiences is, and maybe I've said this on the show that I consider myself pretty basic, pretty middle of the road, pretty privileged in so many ways. And yet I can see the ripple effects in my family of, of these actions. And so if someone like me who is, you know, just pretty average, imagine someone whose family was deeply, deeply targeted and, and what they've experienced. Um, and it, it just reminds me that when we do harm to members of our, our collective human community, it never stays. It, it's kind of like <laughs> harm is a little bit like um, during the pandemic when everyone was like, okay, well, we're closing this border or we're closing this border as if a, vi and a respiratory virus was gonna stop at a border. Um, it's kind of the same thing uh, with communities that were like, okay, well, if we, if we harm these people, that harm is just going to stay there. And it, it doesn't, it moves out. And um, I won't say that everyone is harmed equally or everyone's experiences are exactly the same, but it, it does kind of imbue all of us and none of us can really, really say it, it only one person's hurt. Everybody's hurt. Um, oh. I'm not saying that very eloquently, but oh, I think are. that's what yeah. my experience is. Very eloquently. Me. Very yeah, eloquent. that's very eloquent. And, 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 you know, as a former teacher, uh, one that I, I just think about all the, all the talent that was lost, you know, when all, all of that potential, like, what did we lose out on? um as a, mm. as communities <clears throat> um and i mean there's 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 lots more to that but i i just you know just thinking in <sighs> that's the that's the great unknown right is is all of the <clears throat> all the people that might have written or painted or or you know made music or um all, all that we could have learned from um in terms of the um, native culture here and the respect for the um the land and seeing you know life in every single thing uh and um and it, it uh at any rate it it's a it's a it's a it's a profound loss yeah. Thank you, Tiff. Thank you, Emily. And of course, I, I am very happy you outed me, Emily. Um, we are going to take a quick break and hear from some of our underwriters here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. Uh, so stay tuned. Mm -hmm. Welcome back to the second half of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. If you are just joining us, I am speaking with Representative Emily Kornheiser and Representative Tiffany Bloomley. And I am your host, Olga Peters. You can also find us wherever you find your podcasts and on BCTV. So, Emily, what do we need to remind folks of? Well, Olga, the truth, the truth, the um, thoughts and opinions and things that the people on the show say are those of the host and the guests and not the radio station, nor the TV station, nor the broadcasting channel, nor anyone's employers, loved ones, or neighbors. Thank you. Tiff, you were saying something really beautiful during the break and I stopped you and I said, no, 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 listeners need to hear this. And you were talking about how often, how many moments in history things could have changed. Um, and, and I'd love if you would revisit that for listeners. Well, you, you know, you had asked me about, <clears throat> you, we were commenting on how, you know, um, this ripple effect um, on 
whole groups of people, families, as a result of, of eugenics. And, and I was, it, that was making me think about the conflict between Rome and the Celts and the Celts who saw God in everything and God was alive and they didn't need an intercessor to, um, uh, to reach God. They, they, God was right there, present. And, and Rome won. And, and I've, I've wondered, how might the world look really different had the Celts won out or at least mm-hmm. been allowed to, you know, commingle um, and, and survive in their own interpretation. Um, and, and, and I think that that, <clears throat> when we think about kind of the, the cost of, uh, well, you know, of slavery, of, uh, of eugenics, of redlining. Um, they run deep and, you know, for generations. And, uh, and that's, that's heavy. That's heavy. And that will be, uh, you know, that, that makes the commission's work heavy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So thank you to for, for revisiting that. So Emily. what exactly is the commission's work? I'm realizing <laughs> that we have not talked about that part yet. And I love that our listeners have to wait until after the break to get to this part. Um, <laughs> Cause this is, this is the bill where sort of the, the process um, really is the product in a lot of ways. And mm-hmm. um, I think it is helpful for our listeners to hear more about sure. the work. So um, what are the what are the tasks of the commission, and what do we think well, we, and what the results will be? So, <clears throat> so the legislation doesn't pick the commission. Um, there are five people that are named, five positions that are named in the legislation. And they get together <clears throat> and choose a seven member selection panel, and that selection panel will develop a process for selecting three commissioners. And that will be a public process um, in that anybody could apply to be a commissioner. They, you know, the the qualifications they're looking for um, will be the result of the conversations that that seven member selection panel has and uh, and and it will be informed through conversations with um, with the communities that oh, you know, we've been talking about. And so so at any rate, there there will be for finalists an opportunity for the public to weigh in on individuals, which will be confidential, but uh, but made available to those who are um, selecting the commissioners. And then so those commissioners once selected, and ideally this would be by um, January of next year or by um, March of the following year, um, they, they would then hire some staff and then they make it up. And there, there are basically a few kind of parameters to their work. They must work with community members. That's a, that's articulated really clearly. They uh, have to provide interim reports on what they're doing. They're given broad latitude though, in how they do their work and <clears throat> well, how they structure it and, um, and who is involved. So so, and that, that's the part that we were talking about at the very top of this program, which is, you know, it's, it isn't appropriate for the legislature to decide, you know, how they're going to work. Because we could have all the, lots of ideas that we think make a whole lot of sense to us, but actually don't work, you know, in, in, for example, um, 
There are many indigenous people who have told us, we don't wanna to go to a public hearing. It, that's not gonna feel safe to many members of our communities. And so maybe there are other ways to, um, to draw us out, to tell our stories and to think really concretely about what repairing harm means to us and what it would look like. And so, yeah, is there, sorry. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. Is, um, so they need to, the commissioners once appointed need to mm -hmm. involve the community and provide interim reports. Is there sort of a guiding question that they're answering in their work? Or is it just the word truth and recognition? Mm -hmm. So the idea is twofold. One, to explore the harm that has been done to these communities and possibly others um, that are, is, has been state sponsored. And then secondly, to make recommendations based on what they have heard, based on the recommendations of others uh, about how the state might begin to repair that harm. And, you know, that pretty broad, right? Uh, and I think appropriately so. Mm -hmm. and so and Go ahead, Olga. Sorry, go ahead. I'm, I'm you like, go ahead. I've been asking more of the questions. Than you. <laughs> I'm just so I'm just listening so deeply. I'm I'm so interested by this. Um, how much like power will the commission have to with its recommendations to make sure the the legislature, future legislatures, I should say, will will act on them? None. None. No right. one. I mean, and we can't even do that if we want to. Like, we are not allowed to obligate future legislators. Right. Legislatures. Here's the thing, though. Anything. We are investing money in this. And it will be very public. So I am assuming that there will be a, a interest. There will be public pressure <laughs> to to follow this up because this isn't people have, uh, I think that some of, some of the reporting about this is called this like a study. It is not a study. It is a conversation. And I a love conversation. that differentiation. Huh? That's a really brilliant differentiation. And I really love it. Mm. Well, thanks. I mean, it, it, it <clears throat> and it's the start of, of a conversation. And so, I mean, nobody wants a report that's going to gather dust on somebody's shelf. Nobody wants, this isn't, and it's, I, let academics do the kind of academic research that is, you know, will shed lots of light. This isn't an academic enterprise. This is, this is about <clears throat> better understanding our neighbors. And, and their experiences as Vermonters, given the policies and practices that you know, Vermont um, has had, that we've played a role in, in making. And, and that, you know, so it, it's a really, it's, it's a personal thing, you know, I mean, hopefully it will be. And <clears throat> to that end, then it no report can capture what that is. Hopefully, hopefully the commission will come up with ways to tell these stories and make them more broadly available. <clears throat> and you know, there can be ex exhibitions. There could be a the Folk Life Center could be contracted to do some interviews um, that people could access in different ways. I don't know, but this is part of our living history. It's not, it's not the past. It's, uh, there is a, there is a, 
there are events in the past um, or policies in the past that that matter. But really what matters is how what has people's experience been and and how is it lived out today? I have two very, very different questions, ideas, thoughts, things to say right now. One is um, sort of just in this, you know, to devolve a bit to the actionable. Um, I'm imagining that if we're both in the legislature, once this is moving, um, mm -hmm. that when those sort of interim reports come out, we'll both be sort of mining them for like, legislation, 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 right? And then there'll be a few people in the state house who are sort of regularly doing that and looking for what are the legislative opportunities to make, mm -hmm. um, to make amends or make repair. Um, and so I think, you know, as you said, like there'll be spots along the way before they finish their work, if it can ever be finished, that mm -hmm. there'll be, you know, opportunities to do more things. Um, we don't have to wait mm -hmm. until that happens. Um, the other thing is just, you know, I spent a lot of time for previous um, work in previous work in South Africa um, and to just, you know, was able to see how incredibly powerful it is when an entire country goes through a really meaningful mm -hmm. truth and reconciliation process um, and how I could really see in my time there, which was sort of pretty long, you know, this was just 10 years ago, I spent time there. So it was well mm -hmm. after the, you know, their commission had finished its work. Um, mm -hmm. But we could, I could see in my everyday time there that there was both um, these incredible opportunities for truth telling woven into both everyday culture and just like tourism, right? Like there was just so many opportunities for people to interact with um, and reconcile themselves to what had been and what had happened and what that meant for today. And so that history was sort of this living, breathing part of everything we did there as you know, you were sort of describing Tiff. Um, and then the other part is that what it means for a community when legislation with these huge policy changes that South Africa took on, um, how those are so differently possible when a community has had a broad conversation about what's necessary. When those legislative and policy changes aren't something that are being done by one population to another part of the population, but there's something that everyone has had to reckon with through narrative and through conversation and all those things you're describing to before the legislative action happens and how different that is for so much of how we've been attempting repair work legislatively in this country. Um, I feel like thus far the racial, so much of the racial repair work in this country is in some ways by necessity, um, often a smaller group of people saying, you know, we've seen this truth, we know this truth, this truth is self-evident for anyone paying attention. And so we're gonna act on it because we can't wait anymore. Um, but that leaves behind this group of folks who um, I think in some cases really genuinely don't understand what, why, why we're engaging in, um, mm -hmm. any kind of racial repair. And I don't, you know, in America right now, I'm not saying I think things could be any different. And I don't think we can wait for justice until like everyone is calling for it. Um, but I, I think there's, there's something there. But that's a really interesting point, Emily, because we, we've talked about how do we get as many voices to the table and, and the voices of, of those who have directly experienced the harm or, or you know, the, the ripple effects or still living with the harm. And yet there, there is also the group of people who may not understand or not see how their lived experience is impacted or impacts others. And yeah, how do we bring folks, folks in that group along as well is, is an interesting conundrum too. 
and hopefully <laughs> that's a big part of the work of the commission and all who will be informing that work and influencing it um, because ideally, I mean, it's the commission isn't just doing this. Like we have to own it. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and it enriches us. Like a lot of people don't want to own parts of history that are painful mm -hmm. or make us embarrassed, you know, and still shame. But it is always better to know that history and to have reckoned with it. Mm -hmm. uh, we are closer. We can be closer um, as, as community members when we do. Um, and because we understand one another better. And, you know, you think about the gay rights mov movement. I'm a lesbian and, and I, um, you know, people will say that the gay rights, um, you know, is when people all of a sudden had relatives coming out mm -hmm. that all of a sudden they kind of, it made them think, oh, well, Stevie can't get married. That it doesn't seem really fair. You know, I love Stevie and <clears throat> he and his partner, you know, they should be able to get married. Well, uh, I just think that it's a way of, it, it's connecting us. This history, this process, ideally will connect us with one another in new ways and with people we don't know. Um, and I think we will be stronger for it. You know, something like this, critics of, of truth and reconciliation fear that it, it will tear communities apart, mm -hmm. that it will be divisive, inherently divisive. And I think that not telling these stories and not grappling with it is what is most divisive. Mm -hmm. I agree. So, Agreed. Yeah. Thank you, Tiff. That was really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk to you both. We we have a, just a few more minutes uh, before we need to go, and you know we've we've dug into a lot of different different places. So I just want to touch base. Is there anything? we want to leave listeners with or want to make sure they, they know before we. Uh, I, I think. I want to thank everybody who came to testify before our committee. and was patient with our process because it, it was a long one and it was a hard one too. Uh, and I hope that what we came up with is uh, will will draw on the talent and the expertise that came before our committee. Um, I also really want to extend a lot of uh, gratitude for the work that the International Center for Transitional Justice um, gave to us. I mean, we 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 did a full day training, day and a half of training with them. There's their written materials about truth and reconciliation processes are are great, and they helped sharpen our focus and also understand you know what it is we needed to define in our in our legislation and what we needed to just leave alone. And I uh, Can we include a link to them in our show notes, Olga. Yeah. Yep. And they're easy to find. Uh, What's the bill number? Uh, 96. Thanks. H96. Yeah. And I'll, I'll put a link to that too. And not to reference other podcasts on our podcast, but. Oh no, we definitely the, should. One of the um, leads or directors or something. Um, from that international center did a really good episode with Krista Tippett on being um, 
about a year ago, maybe, um, that I would highly recommend folks. Oh, take. neat. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, in our um, legislative, the training that was provided by ICTJ is streamed on our, um, you know, our committee um, YouTube channel, and oh, it I believe is February the eighth. <clears throat> ninth um you know and that that it, it explains the framework um both for truth and reconciliation and reparations and i i i i highly recommend it they are very very thoughtful and skilled thank you tiff emily thank you for joining us emily would you like to do the quick toast send our show out on a toast yeah um my coffee mug that doesn't even have water in it anymore, let alone coffee. Um, it's like a thrilling toast we have here. Um, so I would like to toast to how Tiff especially, but many more people like Tiff, reckon so deeply with what it means to hold power. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Everyone have a wonderful weekend. We will be back next week. In the meantime, you can find us wherever you find your podcasts on our Facebook page. And Emily, remind us what your page is. Folks can go to emilycornheiser.org and you'll find links to all my social media accounts, email contact, phone number, and my weekly office hour Zoom link. And Tiff, you have a web page as well, I believe. I do, uh, tiffbloomley.com. <clears throat> But Wonderful. I would not recommend going to that web page, <laughs> that website, because I am working on it. It's uh, it. I really haven't done very much. Emily is actually pretty much my uh, model of what oh. to do with a website. Mm -hmm. Well, and many other things, but <laughs> we can stop. Right. Okay, so thank you for coming on, Tiff. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you, Tiff, for having me. Take care, everybody.